This is my desire to honor you. And Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. And all Is in you. 
let's just give them the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Have your way. Have your way, oh God. Hallelujah, Lord. Well, praise the Lord this evening. We greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This evening, it gives us great joy to come to you once again and to share with you, you know, from this beautiful study that we are doing from the book of Daniel. This evening, we want to look into a very well-known, very popular story in Daniel chapter 3, which has to do with, you know, Nebuchadnezzar constructing this great image and this image was supposed to be worshipped by everyone within the kingdom of Babylon. And as most of us would know, when he gave the command that everyone should worship, there were some Hebrew boys that we met earlier in chapters 1 and 2, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, the, the word of God tells us that they refused to worship this image and word came back to Nebuchadnezzar concerning their posture, their decision not to bow and worship. And they were called before Nebuchadnezzar and given a, a challenge for the, for the possibility of maybe recanting and making a compromise and worshiping. But they held their ground. They took a stand based on their strong faith in God. And the result is that they ended up being cast into the burning, fiery furnace that was, as the Bible says, was heated even seven times hotter. But however, we will see that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared in that furnace and came through for them and delivered them. And as a result, when they came out, you know, that was a powerful testimony to the entire world of the greatness of the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who is able and is still able today to deliver us from whatever circumstances the enemy may bring against us. So this evening, I want us to bow heads for a word of prayer as we go into some more detail into this chapter, and then we will give you some insights at the end of this study as to how this story applies to the end-time prophetic calendar with respect to the Jewish nation and to the nations of the world. So, Father, we thank you this evening. We bless you and we praise you and we thank you for this wonderful privilege that you have given to us, Lord, to share from this very beautiful book, the book of Daniel. Lord, we thank you for everyone that is listening this evening, everyone that has been a part of this study from the, from the beginning. And we know, God, you have great things in store for us. Thank you for Reverend Dr. Sharman Alexis, who is on the set this evening. And, and, and Lord, thank you for her what she's been, uh, Lord, the part she's been playing and really helping to uh, lift, oh God, you know, this study to a higher level. In the name of Jesus, we just thank you for the anointing upon her life and the, the, the depths of revelation that will flow through her very life this evening as she shares from this uh, chapter, Lord. We thank you for everyone that is listening in. We bless them in a special way. We thank you again in a very special way for our technical team, Brother David, Oh, God, and his, uh, his, his uh, worship team, bless them in a special way this evening. And we commit this time to you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. A pleasant good evening to you. It's such a joy once again to be in your presence. And <coughs> I trust that you, you took my counsel last week and you went ahead and you would have read Daniel chapter 3. So we look at, uh, let us say, the first three verses. And as we look at the three verses, I want to take a moment just to, to begin by reading. Uh, the Bible tells us here, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits and the breadth six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set, us, set up. So let us be reminded that Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. And as the king of Babylon, he 
is ruling the then known world. There are many provinces, many governors and satraps and leaders and so forth, governing and, you know, being in charge as rulers <laughs> in all of these provinces, which made up the city of Babylon at that time, or we can call it the kingdom of Babylon. And so we need to remember as we go into chapter three, that God had given to Nebuchadnezzar a dream concerning the image. This image was not a golden image. It was an image of gold representing that Babylonian kingdom. And then we saw the silver, we saw the, um, the brass, then the iron, and then the iron mixed with clay. However, you would observe also in chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar recognized that really look at the God of Daniel, look what he was able to do. He worshipped Daniel, and, and we shared a little bit about their whole custom at that time. So even up till this point, Nebuchadnezzar did not have an experience with God. If you look at chapter 2, he says here, then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, and he worshipped Daniel, and he commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet orders unto him. So up till this point, Nebuchadnezzar has not yet come to the realization of really who this God is. And so he was not satisfied with the fact that he would just rule for a time. And so what does he do? He creates, he allows them to make this image of pure gold. And so he sets this image up in the plains of Dura. Now he put the image out in the plains so that as far as your eyes can see, you will be able to see that image. That image, according to the scriptures, was 60 feet or 60 cubits yes. feet by six. six. And uh, in terms of cubits, when you are to transfer it, for example, in terms of our understanding, it would be about 90 feet. But yes. there's a reason why it is 60 by 6 in the scripture. We'll talk about that just a little bit. And so Nebuchadnezzar decided that, listen, <laughs> he is going to let them erect this image, and then now he calls for them to gather. Who does he call? He calls all the leaders of all the provinces, all across Babylon. So the, the, the satraps, the governors, the rulers, he wants them all to come because you see, if he is able to get the rulers and the leaders to bow to this image, then these leaders and rulers will now be able to go back and initiate that kind of worship in Babylon for Nebuchadnezzar. And the Bible tells us that he calls them all, and now they stand before the image that Nebuchadnezzar sets up, and his desire is that they will worship the image. <coughs> Let's look at verses 4 to 7. Yeah, praise the Lord. Uh, well, uh, Reverend Alexis, if you read verses 4 to 7, I'll just give you a quick overview of some things that you know, really stand out from these uh, four verses. From so a herald cries aloud to you, it is commanded, O people, nations, languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sapper, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship it, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the throat, the harp, the sack of the soldier, and all kinds of music. All the people, the nations and languages will fall down and they worship the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. That's Amen. Praise the Lord. And as we look at these verses, some things stand out. Just to back up a bit of verse 1, we will see where Nebuchadnezzar set up this huge image, 60 cubits by 6. 60 cubits high by 6 cubits wide. As Reverend Alexi said, you know, uh, if you um, convert it into feet, that will be 90 feet high by uh, nine. 9 feet wide. A, a light pole is approximately 50 feet high. So it's approximately the height of two light poles. You will see that we see it in our streets, okay? And... Um, 
The question is why he, he placed that strategically in the plains of Jura. There were some reasons, specific reasons, why Nebuchadnezzar chose the plains of Jura, because he knew that uh, if he had taken that image and put it within or constructed it within the city of Babylon, there were many other uh, superstructures, so to speak, that would have made that image look very insignificant. So by putting it uh, within the plains of Jura, it would have stood out, you know, you know as a something very remarkable and something really dynamic. And also to Nebuchadnezzar knew then that the city of Babylon could not accommodate the, the millions of people within the empire who would have been able to come in the plains of Jura and worship as against if they had, if they had to come into the city. The city could not have accommodated that large, you know, numbers of people. But Nebuchadnezzar, as you read verses 6 and 7, you also see that he was seeking to establish universal worship so that, as we saw, all nations and all peoples were supposed to meet and to, the Bible tells us, he was supposed to prostrate in their worship, which would mean they had to they fall flat down on their faces and to actually bow before this image. What was also very important in this uh, passage is that we saw where Nebuchadnezzar used music, and that is a strategy many people use today, you know, even in, in many assemblies where, where we have different forms of worship, because even Satan himself knows. Remember, Satan was, you know, responsible for worship in heaven before he was cast out. And Satan knows how powerful music is. So Nebuchadnezzar is very strategic. He used music in order to help to seduce these people's mind, to bring them into that place where they will be able to, you know, worship. So that, I mean, excellent music. I'm sure the kind of person Nebuchadnezzar was, that music would have been, I mean, the, 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 the best musical people. And those people were, you know, mentally... Uh, and being subdued and brought into that place of worship. So that the command is given for everyone to worship. And then Reverend Alexis will take it from here. So from verse 8 to verse 12, we will observe that there was a conspiracy that was on. Yes. The Bible tells us at that time, certain Corleans came near and accused the Jews. Now it is amazing to see that it is the Corleans who made the decision to accuse the Jews. What do you remember about the Colians? If we were to go back to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 24, hear what it says. Therefore Daniel went in unto Ariok, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. Remember the Colians? They were the wise men of Babylon. And so the plan was to destroy them. And here with Daniel coming up with the interpretation and the revelation of the yes. dream, they were spared. But these are the same people now mm. who are conspiring against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because you are seeing very clearly their hatred for the Jews. Look what verse 10 says. Thou, O king, has made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet and the harp and the sackbut and so forth will worship the golden image. And whoso falls down and worship, that he should be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. And they are called by name Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now you will also notice... Um, in verse 12, when they said, these certain Jews whom thou hast set up over the affairs. So immediately you see that there is some jealousy taking place there, probably based on whatever position they may have had at the time before the dream. Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been promoted. Remember Daniel had made a request on their behalf to be promoted. And so you're seeing that envy, you're seeing the hatred, you're, you're seeing it in, in a very slight way, but it is very, very real. And so 
because of that now, they are bringing the report because these are the people that you can that you promoted. These are the people that you've given, you know, top positions. And listen, these are the very people today you want everybody to worship and they are not prepared to bow and to worship. And so verse 12 <coughs> tells us they have no regard, neither do they serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So they are very specific. And they are saying to Nebuchadnezzar, what you have requested, these Jews, these Jews. And you are seeing the hatred for the Jews. And this is where later on we'll talk a little bit about this Jews and Gentile, you know, the antagonism that is there. Pastor, let's move on to verse 13. In verses 13 to 15, Reverend Alexis, you want to read those verses? Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not you serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? No. If you be ready, at what time you hear the sound of the corner, the flute, the harp, the psaltery, and so on, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of, of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Amen. So as we read these verses, what we see, we see the, the kind of a person that we can as a, as a, as a leader. He uses a measure of diplomacy. You know, he, he doesn't come out and attack these Hebrew boys, but he's presenting a case to them. You know, uh, and he's using a strategy. He's saying maybe it is possible somewhere, you know, the communication to worship this image that I created, you didn't get the communications clear. So let me present it to you once again. Now, this is the instruction that has been given that everyone in this kingdom must bow and worship, you know, and uh, I want you to know a failure to worship, you know, these are the consequences. So what we see here is that Nebuchadnezzar is giving them an opportunity, you know, to, to make a compromise, you know, to recant and to maybe uh, really uh, submit mm -hmm. or back down, you know, just in case you didn't get the message clear, you know, through the, the, the person, the, the herald, you're getting it directly now from the king's mouth, so to speak, so that you know they are left in a position now to actually take a, a bold stand. And this is where we are, you know. So they refused to compromise their faith. Amen. So we're moving on. Let's look at their courage. Verses 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And when you look at these verses and you listen to these young men, yes. you see that remarkable courage in them you know there's a word that stands out here and you know it is the word able yes. you know our god is able and what it tells us is that they had an understanding of the god that they serve that there was no situation there was no fullness it doesn't matter how hot that could deter them from doing what God would have them to do because they knew that their God is able. And I want to just take a couple of minutes just to, to bring out a couple of scriptures from the New Testament that speaks about the very ability of our God. I want to encourage us. You know, uh, sometimes we think of, you know, how big our God is, but then when we are, are faced with a situation, look at the kind of situation. This was a real dilemma that they were in. 
Is our God able to do this? And they knew that their God was able. And so I don't know what situation you may be faced with. I don't know what circumstance. I don't know where you are at. I don't know, you know, what, what, what you are facing in your life even at this moment. But to encourage you that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is your God, is my God, and he is an able God. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the Ephesians, he said, unto him who is able, able to do exceedingly, abundantly. In 2 Timothy, he speaks, he said, for the which cause I suffer, I am not ashamed, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed. These young men knew that God was able to keep them, even if it meant going into the fire. Jude chapter 1 verse 21, 24, it said, Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Hebrews 2, 18, For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So when we face temptation, when we face fiery trials, when we, you know, come against a, a, a rock and a hard place, our God is able. Hear what Hebrews 7.25 says, wherefore he is able also to save to the uttermost. Yes. I don't know where you are at. You may not be saved this evening. You may be in a bad place. You may feel that you have done the worst thing and probably God cannot reach you where you are. The Bible tells us that he is able to save to the uttermost. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. God is able. Just as how he was able to go in the midst of the fiery furnace and deliver them, God is able to go in the midst of the fires of your life and he is also able to save you. So he is able to deliver them and he is able to deliver you this evening. From Praise verse 19. Yes, yeah, so from verse 19 we see something very powerful. We observe where these men were placed in the fiery furnace. The furnace was heated seven times to maximum heat. And the Bible tells us that they were thrown bound hand and feet into this fiery furnace and uh, Nebuchadnezzar and all remember this is something taking place in the public view of hundreds of thousands of people those who would have bowed in his worship that would have included people from all the nations of the world and that multitude would have included other Jews who would have been compromising their faith and would have been living in fear of the actual judgment of the, you know, being placed in fire first. So these three young men stood out. They were standout Christians, so to speak. And uh, I just wanted to share something as I looked at this, in that when these people were uh, in the land of Judah, you know, what God wanted really was for his people to be the light to the Gentiles, so that the Gentiles would see something different about these people and want to serve God. They refuse to, to live up to God's standards. And in this we see God, you know, knows how to get glory in every situation. So here it is, they fail to do what they were supposed to do while they were in their land. God places them in a strange land now. So the multitudes are looking on and these three human boys, they are like spectacles. And Jesus shows up as a fourth man in the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar, again, we see for a second time, receiving divine revelation. He got divine revelation from the dream. And we see him now getting divine revelation. He makes a declaration. You see, I see a fourth man in the fire. And he is like unto the Son of God. No, that needs no private interpretation. The fourth man in the fire is the very person of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that when Nebuchadnezzar realized that these Hebrew boys were not being burned by the fire because the, the god of fire in Babylon is called Isba, I-Z-B-A-R, the god of fire. So God, in a sense, was judging Isba to let the Babylonians know that, you know, the, his people, there's a promise that God gave to his people even before. Remember we said earlier on, that, you know, when God wrote this book of Isaiah, 
in the book of Isaiah, these people would have had a knowledge of this book over a hundred years before they went into captivity. Now they are in captivity. They would have had access to the scriptures. You know? So we are in the book of Daniel. Daniel is also in captivity. And these people will be able to have access to the scriptures and see in Isaiah 43 where God gives them a promise. When you go to the waters, it would not cover you. You wouldn't drown. When you go to the fires, the fires will not burn you. The fires will not consume you. So we see God living up this world, even in this situation here, where Jesus shows up. They are in the fiery furnace, and the fire could not consume them because the God is served. He is a consuming fire. So it was a case of like, you know, the Lord was fighting fire with fire, so to speak, because he is the all-consuming God. And that fire lost its power because of the presence of Jesus there. And Nebuchadnezzar realizing what was happening, this thing was becoming a spectacle. It was such a powerful testimony. No, Nebuchadnezzar is trying to shut down this thing because God was getting some glory. So he's begging them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out from the fiery furnace. And I want to encourage us this evening because many of us, you be going through different fires. And you're longing for God to, to take care from that fire. But God will not remove us from some situations until he gets some glory out of it. So stay in that fire. You know, appreciate the fire. Thank God for the fire until God sees it fit to take us out from the fire. Don't run out from the fire. You stay there like the Hebrew boys. And Nebuchadnezzar said, come out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they came out at the king's command. And he inspected them. And the Bible tells us not even one hair on their body was singed. Nothing, not even smoke. That was, God was literally shutting down the God of fire and letting them know truly, he alone is the true and the living God. God bless you. Amen. And Pastor, you know, even as you're sharing there, what comes to mind as you look at verse 22, you know, it says, therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace oh, exceeding yes. hot, oh, yes. the flame oh, yeah. of the fire slew those men My that goodness. took up Shadrach, Meshach, wow. and Abednego. Wow. And what I see there is those who were there to put their hands on the children of God, yes. they are in trouble. Yes. They are in trouble. And so they were slain, yes. and at the same time, that same fire that slew them, did not even touch Shadrach, Meshach, yes. and Abednego. Touch not mine anointed, says the Lord. And Amen. my ministers, my servants no harm. The last couple of verses here, verses 28 to 30, we will see a confession. Again, what we would see is Nebuchadnezzar making one more step. Let's look at it. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who had sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, language will speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And what we see here in chapter 2, we saw where Nebuchadnezzar, as we read earlier, he, he gave all the credit to Daniel, yes. and he made Daniel like a god. He still did not um, come to conversion, as we come to this place here, we see he's just only one step further. And so what he does now, he recognizes that it's not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are the gods, but there is a God. There is a God. Why? Because he had a revelation of the Son of God. But at the same time, when you look at it, you will see that he speaks of the God of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. So he had not yet come to the place where he recognized him as the true and the living God in his own life at this particular juncture. And Pastor, as we look at the entire chapter, um, 
this chapter brings out so much typology. Yes. Uh, could we for a moment just look at some of the typology that comes out of Daniel chapter 3. While it is a, a, a physical story that is really happening here, it is also quite prophetic. And yes. let's just look at that part of it. Uh, Reverend Alexis, uh, there's some things I just wanted to share in me for me. Go and deal with the aspect of the typological, okay. you know, uh, uh, factors in this chapter. In that, uh, as as a, a, an entire chapter, you know, uh, looking at it, you know, a broad overview, you know, three things stand out that we must always remember as the people of God. One, that the people of God are a persecuted people. So persecution is something that we must not be afraid of. And Jesus. Uh, spoke about that in, in John 16, 33, persecution. He said, in this world, you know, he said, we will have tribulations and persecutions. He said, but we have good cheer. I have overcome the world. But not only we see persecution, but we see when he showed up in the fire, we see his protection. So persecution, you know, is not an end in itself. The Lord will protect us. But it's like sometimes, you know, the people of God, we, we, we like to get prophecies about God will promote us and bless us. But promotion came to these three boys only after they went through the persecution, you know, and that led to God's protection, and then we see their promotion. So these are three fundamental elements that we must recognize that they characterize the life of a Christian. You will face at times persecution, but the persecution is not an end in itself, that God will bring us through that uh, situation protect us from whatever the enemy is planning against us. And a promotion is guaranteed. Another thing that you know that stands out is that uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, uh, shows us something uh, that we need to be uh, very much aware of as believers. And this is what a, a truth I wrote on. Divine revelation, if not held in fellowship with God, may actually cause us to become puffed up just as Nebuchadnezzar, because chapter two, this man, based on his dream, he got he got a revelation directly as an unsaved man. God spoke to him and gave to him a, 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 a whole insight into the times of the Gentiles, right down to the coming of Jesus Christ to set up his millennial kingdom. And between chapters two and three, approximately 20 years to 23 years have come and gone. And he is walking, and, and I mean, moving around the kingdom of Babylon as someone who is divinely favored by the God of heaven. And he, rather than humble himself, as Reverend Alexis said earlier, and accept the Lord, he gave Daniel gifts and he gave them some promotion, but there was no change in this man's heart. And we see now in chapter 3, that pride continues to build to the extent now where he put up this image that, you know, supposed to be worshipped. And we saw it's a measure of presumption because we asked Daniel give him a very accurate revelation that the head of gold, it, it gifted Nebuchadnezzar that, look, his kingdom has, there's a timeline to his kingdom. Some, some other kingdom is going to come after, but he was so presumptuous and proud that he actually was seeking to establish like an eternal kingdom in a sense, you know, because the whole image is of gold. So God had to actually deal with this man's heart. And we will see that in chapter 4. But if we come to uh, uh, the book of Corinthians, we will see another great man of God who was exposed to great revelations, the Apostle Paul. And God knew, you know, that as a man, that, you know, once men are getting great revelations, you know, if God doesn't actually do something to keep that man humble, that man would become proud like Nebuchadnezzar. So when Paul, the Apostle, was taken up into the third heaven, and he received abundance of revelation. He testified in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, one, chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. And he spoke about, you know, because of the abundance of revelation given to him, the Bible says that he received something called a thorn in the flesh. And he prayed about this thing over and over. Three times he said, and because of the fact that, you know, he wasn't getting an answer the first time. And the second time, after the third time, God spoke to him. And says, um, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. You know, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And God wants us, when he gives us revelation, to walk in humility. 
and Nebuchadnezzar didn't do that. And you will see what will eventually happen to him in chapter 4. But by way of typology, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the Antichrist in this uh, chapter. And if we look at the very image, the dimensions of the image, you know, 60 by 6, 60 cubits by 6, 60 cubits high, 60, 6 cubits wide, they, uh, that this is an intimation of the image that the Antichrist will set up, as we see in Revelation 13, and the mark that he will give to people to worship that image is a mark, you know, the mark of the beast, 666. So we've seen an intimation of all these things here with respect to this image, Nebuchadnezzar, in this chapter being a type of the Antichrist, and the, the actual image being a type of what we call the abomination of desolation, we will see in Revelation 13, and in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus alluded even to this situation here. We will see it again in Daniel chapter 11, the abomination of desolation, something that was actually actually perpetrated by another person in Daniel 11, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, when he desecrated the temple, and he went further than just desecrating the temple by offering, um, you know, swine, but he actually uh, use all these special chambers in the temple in Jerusalem as a brothel for prostitution. So that is, so the abomination of desolation wasn't just the sacrifices, but what he actually uh, he used the actual uh, the temple, the, the evil, wicked practices that he allowed. So that uh, these are just some of the uh, typologies that you see from this chapter. Also the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, they represent, you know, the sealed 144,000 Jews uh, that God preserved. You know, God always works with a remnant. So he, he preserved a remnant, 144,000, that the enemy tried everything to destroy. As we go to Revelation and the book of Revelation, we see that happening in chapter 7, where God sealed 144,000, 12,000 Jews from the... Uh, from 12 tribes, giving 144,000 uh, Jewish people. And at the end of the book of Revelation, coming on to around chapter 15, we will see them still standing because of the seal of God. So the three Hebrew boys in typology, they represent you know, those Jews that were sealed and preserved throughout the Great Tribulation. And at the end, they, know they were still there, unskated, untouched by all the evil plots of the Antichrist. So, I, Sister Lessis can take it from here. All right. I just wanted to add to what you were sharing there with the 144,000 because um, many times in the times in which we live, there is just so much confusion about the 144,000. And even though we see the three Hebrew boys in type representing the 144,000, let it be very clear according to Revelation 7 4. Uh, it reads, I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 100 and 44,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And as you continue to read, it would say of the tribe of Judah, of the tribe of Reuben, and it would go down like this. So let us be very clear that 144,000 are Jews, specifically Jews. And so these Jewish boys are representation of the 144,000. And also, just as the Hebrew boys were promoted, the, we are looking forward to that great day yes. when we will all be promoted, all right, in the millennial kingdom. And Pastor, you could just probably bring it to a close as we come to um, the typology with respect to the deliverance that took place in um, Babylon that day. Yes, so that as the Hebrew boys, as they were taken out of that fiery furnace and given positions of prominence, you know what, that, that's a prophetic picture when Jesus Christ comes again and he sets up his uh, millennial kingdom, he destroys the Antichrist. He takes the Antichrist, you know, in Revelation he's called the beast. The Antichrist works with uh, another person called the false prophet. They will be cast into the lake of fire. Satan will be bound for a thousand years and Jesus will establish his millennial kingdom, as we saw from chapter 2, that stone that crushed the image, and then it was actually, it, it, it was established into like a great mountain that filled the earth, 
And when that does happen, Jesus' is, is capital um, would be in Jerusalem, and his people will be given positions of prominence. So the same way that Nebuchadnezzar promoted Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so too in the end time, the people of God will be promoted to a position of prominence and positions of leadership in his millennial kingdom. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the opportunity we have to share your word. Yes, Lord. And Lord, we pray that as we continue to study the book of Daniel, we pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to give us revelation. We are thanking you for each person on the platform. Let their yes. hearts continue to grow in grace yes. and in the knowledge of Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity. Make this study a continual blessing to the body of Christ and to those, Lord, who need to know you in these closing times. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We want God to remind you. you to please read chapter 4 ahead because it is quite a long chapter. We will not be able to do the reading of the entire chapter. So God bless you and God see you next you. week. Praise the Lord.